let me just kick off. Uh, the Wingmasters Award is a nonprofit photography project initiated to both spark awareness and engage the public on social relevant, socially relevant issues of great importance to Hong Kong. Um, the mission of the Wingmasters Award is to stimulate discussion and to encourage development of social responsibility in Hong Kong. Um, it also aims to support and raise the level of photography as an art form in Hong Kong while at the same time employing the medium to consider and discuss pressing social issues facing Hong Kong. Last year, our theme was poverty. This year, it's air. Um, and this time, we're very honored to have um, on the panel today for the community from mass participation to activist art. We've got our two judges for the Wing Masters Award speaking today. Um, can I call on Abby Chan, uh, curator and artistic director at the Chinese Cultural Foundation of San Francisco. Um, Louise Clements, artistic director of Quad. Um, Louise. And also the session will be moderated by Jian He, uh, art, artist and professor at SCAD of Hong Kong. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Kian He. I'm, I'll be the moderator for our first panel discussion regarding the community mass participation and activism. And the first um, presentation will be done by Abby Chen. Um, there was a brief introduction, so I'll just have you get started. Is that okay? And then um, it will be about 20 minutes, and then another 20 minutes of Louise Clement's presentation regarding her projects. Great. I hope you can all hear me. Thanks for everyone coming today. Thanks for all the team at Wingmasters for inviting us to be part of the jury panel and for um, inviting us to come and talk and discuss about participation, um, activist art, and all things to do with engagement and, and um, in that territory. But it's great that it's quite a small audience. I hope you're all going to participate and engage and ask us questions. So m treat it more as a, a round table, a conference kind of in discussion. So we're, I'm going to go through quite a few projects um, and then Abby's going to hone in on a couple. And then we've got time at the end for for a discussion really. So one of the points of this is that you will participate, hopefully. Um, so we want to hear your views and um, thoughts on what we've been talking about. Ooh, how do I start? So do I use the control panel up here or just the key keyboard? Okay. Okay, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, here we go. So just a short intro to me. I've only got 20 minutes, so it's gonna be kind of a feast. Um, the idea of my talk is to give you a really brief overview of lots of different projects that involve participation in many different forms. So this is my Center for Contemporary Art and Film. It's called Quad. Um, I've been working there since 2001. Before that, I was working as a freelance curator and an artist. I've still got a studio. I still try to make my own work, but I have very little time. Um, but mainly, I'm, I'm curating and directing the team here. We have about 70 people. We have exhibition spaces. Um, studio space and residency space, a nice cafe, and three cinemas, um, and exhibition space all throughout the building. It's right in the city centre, it's right in the marketplace of Derby. And Derby is a small city in the middle of England, um, but it has a really vibrant community. A lot of artists there, a lot of musicians there, and it's um, a very uh, exciting place to work in terms of uh, the opportunities there to kind of really transform people's lives. Um, so this is inside the building. This is our exhibition spaces. So our program uh, works in four seasons throughout the year. We organize exhibitions. We, every exhibition is part of a season. So we will arrange workshops and masterclasses um, at the, the core exhibition itself. But we do um, curate the exhibitions. We do open calls. We collaborate with other partners. Kind of general uh, gallery fair. But the difference around that is the way that we curate the show. So this is just a few examples here. So we do everything from kind of major survey shows. So the top left hand corner is um, Ian Breakwell. He's one of the first artists to start working with video as an as a artistic medium. Um, and that was a, a retrospective of his, uh, of his life's work. The other corner at the top is a collaboration that we made with Hayward Gallery. It's one of the, one of the galleries in, in London. And that was around magic, so it had things like um, archive material, new commissioned works. So the plinth that you see in the middle, that's a cursed space. We invited a 
professional witch to come and curse that space around there. So it was all around magic, um, suspension of disbelief, sleight of hand, trickery, and our kind of playing with our trust in ideas and imagination and so on. Um, the very colorful image in the bottom left is um, an exhibition that we did with a collaborative team called Juno Projects. And they're two artists who work together to create platforms for engagement. So we gave them the gallery space for seven weeks and we wanted them to come up with an idea to involve as many people as possible. How do you create an open platform where anyone can come with an idea if they want to do something, whether it's a performance, whether it's one that they want to show their artwork, how do you combine all those things? In the end, we have about 500 different organizations proposed ideas to us. And we also tried to do creative matchmaking in terms of there was a St. John's Ambulance, which is the voluntary ambulance service. They wanted to come and do um, practical first aid training. There was an alternative Shakespeare company who wanted to do a performance and they wanted, wanted people to be part of their performance as well. So we decided to put the two together. And in Shakespeare, you find that there's a lot of um, emergency situations. There's poisonings, there's stabbings, there's... Uh, broken bones, there's all kinds of things, sword fights. So every time, every instance of a, of a calamity that happened during the performance, the St. John's Ambulance would come and give them practical first aid and the public could learn in the process of how to, you know, how to deal with poisoning, how to, uh, how to deal with cuts and bruises and so on. So it was kind of um, a performance that then went on to, to other, other cities around as well. So these kind of models, you can kind of experiment with groups that wouldn't otherwise work together and allow them to, to do something that, uh, in a supported environment and then champion them to other organizations. Um, but that, that project was, you know, it was very chaotic, like a lot of mass participation projects are. But it was something that was, there was always something happening. People could come into the gallery space, see it being used in a different way. I mean, it, we're very keen and interested in working with exhibitions and ideas in a variety of contexts, so presenting work that's ready made to survey artistic careers as well as support people to generate new work in the space and contribute in that way. The other image with the big sculpture, that's from our senior curators. So all the curators are over 70 years old. Um, they had never curated before. They wanted to see what that's all about. So we set up a team, we invited one professional curator, full-time curator, to come and coach those participants through the process. We worked with the Arts Council collection, which is the national collection in the UK. And you can view all the artworks online. There's all kinds of things in there, photography and sculpture and painting and um, all kinds of variety of artworks. And we worked alongside those curators to explain to them about ways of selecting the theme, what, how do the artworks sit together in the space, how do you interpret the artworks, dealing with the audience, all these kinds of things to um, tackle when you're putting a show together, as well as the time scales and the budgets and the um, practical transportation issues and so on. Um, this is uh, an exhibition that we had recently in Quad. This is um, Lindsay Sears, and she works with, with people, for this artwork called Monocular, she worked with people with a particular condition where you merge with your twin in the womb and you end up with attributes of the other person mixed with yourself. <coughs> or you are two people as one, basically. And, and the most visible sign of that is one blue eye and one brown eye. And she photographed animals and human beings and worked with them to talk about how they conceptually think about their, their psychology, their, their, their lives, and the issues that they go through. And then she created one film from a residency that she did in Norway and created this Norwegian hut in the gallery space and showed the film projection mapped, so this uh, landscape. It's a dialogue b between her and the, the one person that she worked through. And this guy had um, cancer in one of his eyes. And he's talking about how this other eye is kind of possessing his mind and kind of going through all these um, traumas as well as the dealing with the cancer. So it's a Can you hear me OK? Is it on? Should I speak a bit closer? Yeah? Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> OK. So this is our current exhibition, and, and it's in collaboration with an organization called Slide Luck Pot Show. And they work with artists to show their slideshow films. Um, they also uh, support production as well. But we did a survey of the, the last six years of Slide Luck London, which is, um, Slide Luck has different 
branches all over the world. They started in New York um, and now they have in Berlin and um, I don't know if there's one in Hong Kong yet, but there could potentially be. Um, you can look on their website, you can approach them about initiating one. So the idea is that it's a... Yes, there we go. Hey. <laughs> awesome. So he's he's great, and he's, they've they've done um, they've done amazing things over the last. I think it started more than six years ago, but the London edition has been going for six years. So we surveyed all the the events. So it's basically an event show slideshows, um, and people bring food. So it's it's a kind of collaborative process in terms of people making food, talking about their recipes, and we made a book and an exhibition. So here's, uh, here's some little sales from that. Um, and we showed each film on a separate screen, um, but we asked people to come and cook for us during the exhibition period. Um, the, the, the point of the recipes in the book is to kind of, exp in this territory of expanded photography, we wanted people to taste the moment as well as kind of get into the ideas of the photo stories. So alongside the photo stories, which is everything from uh, transgender communities in Mongolia through to kind of the, the a loneliness in in, uh, in China from single parent, uh, single child families, and um, age in Japan and so on. So there's 24 different photo stories alongside the recipes, and you get a real real taste for what the artist was thinking, eating, doing at the time where they were. So you get a flavour for the work in a kind of a different way from just reading the text about the the content of the the photo story. We also organize other festivals, so I'll get onto format in a second, but we organize ID Fest, which is a film festival. Um, we collaborate with artists in that area as well. So this is Harold Schmickler, the guy in the berry at the top. His head's been cut, unfortunately. Um, he's, uh, he transcribes films, so if you, when you're in there watching the film, by the time you come out, he's, he's watched the entire film and transcribed it through his drawings, so you can revisit the film through the artist's mind as well. Um, that's a shot from inside our cinema. We have two, two main screens like this and another one that's a bit more flexible performance space and each of them show uh, traditional film, film medium as well as digital film as well. Um, this is the street arts festival that we organized called Fest Day and this, this, start, this performance last year just recently was um, called As the World Tips and this was participatory in terms of inviting people to submit images that would get projection mapped onto the, the stage. So you see the big stage on the right hand side, that starts off flat and uh, the performers are performing kind of more traditional theatre on, on there but then as it starts raising up you realise that it's, uh, it's on a crane, everyone's on wires and they start performing on this vertical surface that gets projected on with the images um, as you can see on the, on the left hand side. And I'm here to talk about participation and people. And in quad and format, since our instigation from over more than 25 years ago, has been involved with community arts, mass participation, participatory arts, and uh, as well as commissioning high-profile contemporary artists. And how you merge the two is, is a really fascinating area for us that we're constantly researching and experimenting with. So one of our biggest projects recently was uh, the Derby Soap Opera. This was the initial title for it, and it eventually went on to be called La Rosas. And it's working with Marinella Senatori. She is a director. She lives in Italy, but she's traveling all over the world constantly. And she's worked with, her thing to do is to work with entire communities. Our ambition with, with her was to work with every single occupant of Derby, which is about 250,000 people. But, um, that's it. We nearly spoke to everybody, I think, but in the end, we worked with 20,000 people, which is still a lot of a lot of a lot of people to work with. And the idea with her work is that she creates this kind of new social platform for people to engage. So it's a real cross section of of, of the communities in the city. We wanted her to work with um, all kinds of people, not only artists. There are many artists in the city, but we wanted her to work with everyone who wanted to be part of it. So. Um, it's a, a free exchange of um, skills. Um, she, we found filmmakers in the city, we found sound artists, we found people who could make the sound effects, we found people who wanted to make the costumes, make the script, um, do the post-production, do the filming. So we do lots of workshops and masterclasses. I and mean, if you think about it practically, how do you actually get 20,000 people engaging in a, in a real a practical way is, is a huge task. So we, I mean, filmmaking, creating a, a major film does include a lot of component parts, um, but it does need a high level of professionalism as well. So 
to build in enough time for people to develop their skills and their ideas, go through the discussion groups and actually come out at the end to produce something that's meaningful and engaging for audiences to watch um, is, a, is a huge enterprise. We also collaborated with two other organizations, so it was a trilogy. Um, each film was about 45 minutes long. We worked with Institute in Madrid and one in Berlin as well. And some of the actors actually travel to the different locations as well. So it's three 45 minute long films um, that get shown in gallery spaces. It's just recently been at the Guggenheim. And the point of the, of the project that she, that she puts together, she's very much the director of it, collaborating with myself and my team. I have curators that work with me. I have, um, we have a great technical team. Uh, we have about five technicians in-house in who understand filmmaking as well as, as uh, producing exhibitions and live events. Um, and we built a set in the gallery space that was also an open platform. So when it wasn't being used for filming, groups could propose ideas of what they wanted to do in the space. And, um, and we, we shot a music video there. But the rest of the time, it was being used by the cast and the crew for training, for, for um, filming the, the film itself. And it's another way to turn over the gallery space for public engagement as well. We trial things that we've shown more standard exhibitions, but we also want to use the gallery space in shorter ways for, for kind of more lively interaction as well. This is some of the shots from the street, um, all kinds of groups. So we've got the colliery brass band mixing with the young, young girls who are ballet dancers dancing down a normal street in the city. Um, and just the practical things about talking to every, part, every um, occupant of that street to ask them to, if they had a car, they could move it on that day when we need to do the filming. Exponentially, you end up engaging with so many more people through the process of doing these, these projects. Um, and they encounter what we're doing at Quad and our ethos around engagement and wanting people to be part of what we're doing. We're not just a centre where you come and look at exhibitions. We want actually people to participate in what we're doing and they get to hear that message. So later on, the legacy of that is that hopefully they'll be more amenable to participate in the future or they'll come and see or take part in what we're doing. Um, moving on to another project, this is one that we launched our center with. Um, Bill Drummond is quite an infamous artist in the UK. He was very famous in the 80s and 90s for being in the KLF. He worked with Tammy Wynette, who's kind of quite a maverick um, musician, um, kind of really popular music at the time as well. Um, and then he went on to be an artist, and he famously did the alternative Turner Prize. And the Turner Prize, if you don't know already, is one of the biggest art, like contemporary art prizes in the UK. And in the year, um, in one of the years, he offered a comparable amount of money, and he selected the worst artist, and he nailed it to the gates of of the Tate of Tate Britain, and told the artist to go and get the money. He's quite che he's very kind of cheeky and. Um, uh, yeah, so he, he also one of his famous events was he burned a million pounds, um, which is very decadent, but he also does a, new, a no music day. He's very genuine, actually, and he does care very much about um, how we encounter music. He loves music, but so he's trying to tussle with this, the issue that everything is available on demand and kind of we're losing contact with that, um, the purity or the beauty or the kind of creativity of producing music live and witnessing that and the sound that you have to remember and it's a transient thing and witnessing that that kind of moment of beauty. So he does a No Music Day where he works with one of the major radio stations, BBC Radio, radio 4, and they play no music all day uh, and people concentrate on what that means if they tune in. Oh, but he talks about it a lot as well so you can encounter that in different ways. So with us, the idea was that we would work with 1,700 people um, in, se in groups of 17, and they each would uh, sing a single note for, for 10 minutes, I think it is, I can't remember now. It was, it was 2008 with the dis the, the, this project. Um, but these were the range of groups that we asked to participate. So it's a real cross-section of, of the community, all kinds of people, and they were asked to self-define. They could come and propose a group to us that wasn't on our list as well. So it's everything from counsellors, visitors, traffic wardens, mothers, pigeon fanciers, and there are plenty in Derby, um, news agents, cricket players, key cutters, nurses, sex workers, chefs, clubbers, all kinds of things. And we had quite a lot of new groups come along as well. So just the logistics of arranging all these groups, getting everyone together on the same time, on the right day, <laughs> in the right place, um, and for them to 
do what they needed to do as well. So they had to sing a single note for, for 10 minutes in the pentatonic scale. Bill Drummond would do a performance for them and then they would reciprocate by singing the single note as a, as a, a small choir. And then all these voices would be combined into one single track and that would be played back in, in the main center of Derby in the marketplace um, as, an, as an awesome um, kind of sound wave for 10 minutes with all these 1,700 voices coming back to the audience and then it would be deleted. Um, these are some of the choirs. So there's punks, uh, traffic wardens, DJs and Morrissey fans. And that's the whole lot of them. I mean, you can kind of see some of the failures in there. We tried to look for 17 Sarahs. There was only one. Um, but it's, we included that as well. It's kind of important to expose the, the, um, the process in, in the making of the work as well. So the, it culminated in an exhibition. So everyone was photographed in their group. Everyone was filmed for one minute standing still-ish. Um, and that was shown as a film work in the in main square. We've got a big public TV there, so that was shown on, on a daily basis. Um, so everyone could see themselves, they could come into, into our building and, and see themselves. And they, they also had the collective memory of the deletion of, of their voices. And we didn't really reckon with how powerful that would be until it happened and how shocked people would be, because we're so used to having something that we can hear again or repeat. And, but also kind of uh, how our collective memory is going onto our mobile phones or onto the internet, and we can always go back and, and reference it, and we know where it is, it's stored there online, and we can repeat or share. Or, um, but the idea that something so momentous for people had been deleted was really shocking for them, especially people who hadn't taken part in an artwork before. They were really, some were appalled by it, some were really, um, yeah, and we tried to tried to stop people recording it on the day, but I'm sure plenty did because everyone's people are quite naughty as well. Um, but it's quite a beautiful thing, and it was um, really transformatory for for people. And uh, this is Bill Drummond here on the top of his Land Rover. He's he's got a farm, so he comes with uh, like straw sticking out of his boots, and he's uh, he's uh, quite an interesting character. Um, but he really, he really made an impact on, on the public, and people still today are talking about their experience of taking part in it. He also did this public artwork that people see on, on, the, on a regular basis. He came back to the gallery one day covered in paint, and we were like, Bill, where have you been? He's like, uh oh. And then later on, we saw in the newspaper he'd been there graffitiing, and graffitiing is illegal, obviously, it is, it is in many places, isn't it? And this project was funded by the council. And he's literally defacing council property, and there's, like, there's always some always some trouble <laughs> that goes on with the with the artists. But it's great; we were really happy with that, and uh, um, yeah, we we deal with the council as we go along. But it's still there, and it's, it's supported as the as the council um, go and paint over it to, to make it disappear. Some of the some anonymous general public comes along and repaints it, so it keeps coming back, keeps resurfacing all the time. Um, so Format Festival, just moving on, is, um, is a festival set up in 2004. It's one of the biggest photo festivals in the UK. Um, and we work with um, a biennial formula. So we have it every two years. In our off year, we organize a big portfolio review. And um, our commissions program happens in the off year as well. So this year is the off year. And we're doing a lot of um, preparation for 2015. This is the kind of general f festival fair. We have a focus program, which is the curated shows um, and invited and um, partner program. Exposure is a big open call. Development is our workshop and, and on and on. So you can see the rest there. Um, this here's a few shots from the festival. Unfortunately, people need to wear coats there. It's not, it's not a very warm place, but we do a lot of activity outside and we, we welcome people to come and engage in, in what we do out there. Um, last year we had the festival theme was around factory and mass production. So Derby is the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. It has UNESCO World Heritage status for that alongside the pyramids and other places around the world. It has the world's first factory, that's that blue building there, and mass production is said to have begun there. So we use that as an idea in terms of collaborative practice, transformation of material, and our working lives. So we examine that through a whole range of exhibitions. Um, and you can check out more on our website. I won't go further into that. But um, 
here's some more shots from inside. So you get kind of a flavor for the, the liveliness and the, the variety of spaces that we have exhibitions in. And we want people to really get their hands on. So just to draw out some of the participation projects that we had there. This one that was um, crowdsourced funded, and it's um, by Brian Griffin. And when we talk about participation and participants, there's home, so many ways that people can take part in projects. So this one where we invited um, Brian to propose an idea to us uh, that resonated with Joseph Wright, the painter. He's one of the most uh, incredible painters. He, he grew up in Derby, so we're referring to him. He, we think he would have been a photographer had he been around today. He's an incredible painter of light. Um, as is Brian Griffin, he's, he composes his images. He's, uh, he uses the available light sources as well as studio lights, but he composes in camera. And we asked him to think about people in the city that would have been painted by Joseph Wright at the time. And then we approached all these people, invited them to, to be participants in the, in the exhibition and for have their photograph taken. But we also asked them to pay about £750 per, per um, uh, place in the, in the show. And part of that was that they would receive a print um, and they would be in discussion with the whole project. So in the end, we had about 25 participants, and they all contributed their ideas and their resource and enabled us to do something that we couldn't otherwise afford to do. And he created this whole idea, the still waters, I don't know if you know Twin Peaks, but this kind of uh, still waters run deep, and kind of the undercurrents of the city, the people, the power structures, they were all powerful people in the city that, that contributed to this project. Um, the Caravan Gallery is, um, is an initiative by two people. They travel around all over the UK and Europe and beyond, wherever they can take their caravan. They, it's a pop-up exhibition. They curate the shows inside, but they also ask people to tell them about different places in the city. So before they come there, they'll come and take photographs. They're quite amusing. They're quite quirky. I don't know if you've seen the book, Boring Postcards, but they come and kind of find and examine the, the most unusual areas of the city and really expose it back to us. And it's a place where you can come, you can come and visit, have a cup of tea with them in their caravan and, and talk about these places and also see the other places that they've visited in and around the city and beyond. Um, exposure is our open call, so we invite people to propose ideas for participatory projects. Last year we had about 70 projects. Um, some of them were exhibitions, some of them were new commissions, some were setting up a pop-up dark room, some were for more mass participatory engagement pro projects. Um, and one of them was around working with the archive in the city. So this came along as a, there was about 30 people that wanted to work and examine the archive and produce an exhibition that, that really dug down deep into the archive material and uncovered some images and found an amazing photographer that we hadn't seen before. I mean, some of the things that come out of that is uh, you have to open, open your mind and allow a process to occur. Obviously, these, these were people that hadn't curated before. We were, had to trust that they had uh, ideas that would fit with our, our festival program and quality. Um, but we coached them through the process, and they uncovered some amazing images that even the archivist at the archive hadn't seen before. And they've gone on to, to have bigger shows later on as well. Um, but one of the biggest things in, in format last year was the human photo factory and this included a lot of different projects so we had an old chocolate factory where we invited people to come and engage in the projects that we'd commissioned this is one of them this is the archive of modern conflict they're a really fascinating organization based in the uk and um, in they initially started in canada but they have people working for them all over the world and they collect photography and they work with uh, vernacular archives, but one of the projects they proposed for us was a, a, a zine making workshop. So you could clock in using the little card there. You had 30 minutes to make a, a small photo magazine, and then all of these would be exhibited as part of the festival, and now they're going on to be part of a publication. It was a real fun, it was a real um, kind of a scrum for images. There was a table full of material, there's all these um, other things that you could do there. So. You, People were talking to each other. It really kind of made an instant community where people were participating, commenting. Um, it was in the context of the launch of the festival, so there was a lot of kind of leading photo book producers, designers, editors, and photographers there, and they were all kind of getting in there and, and producing. Some of them were really great, um, and they've gone on to... The publish, publication is coming on soon, but you can look on the Archive of Modern Conflict website and see, see more about that. Um, this is a project we call um, around factories in Birmingham. How's time doing? 
a little bit over, okay, sure. Um, and he collaborated with the workers in the factory. So there was about 250 workers there. And the factory was closing down. They're producing steel wire. And he made, he recorded their voices and they collaborated in terms of producing a soundtrack that was then remixed by a DJ. And you could come as an audience member and, and pick the, the soundtrack off the, off the shelf and listen to it and kind of create your own soundtrack to their artworks. Um, this is a photo puzzle, literally participatory. There was about 10,000 people that took part in this one, trying to put the, put the window back together. Very simple in way of engaging people in the space. We're always thinking about how, how do we encourage people to spend more time in the gallery space? What is it that they can get involved with? And this artist proposed a very simple idea, but it worked very well. People spent a lot of time working on that. Um, everything bled down through into everything that we were doing. And this is our uh, festival catalog. It's a participatory book. So we stopped the machine before it cut around the edges of the, the silver area in the center. And actually, you had to use the contents page um, bookmark to open up the pages. Literally, you had to become a worker on the book to finish it off and to see the content and un unlock the pages. Uh, this is a project we did with uh, India, with Calcutta. Um, so there's 25 photographers in Calcutta, 25 photographers in the UK. They're collaborating through Skype um, and FaceTime and Google Hangouts. And they were making work. They were discussing it together through that platform. They were coached by workshop leaders in the two different countries. And they were produced material. They wanted to co-curate it. it. Turned out to be an exhibition at the end. Um, this is our exhibition app. So when people come to visit the festival, we ask them to, to use this app. And we have QR codes next to all the artist statements. So you can go through to the app. You can find out more. You can read more text. You can see the interviews that we do with people. You can also build up your own visit to the festival. So you can take photographs um, and write text. And so it's kind of like a, a, a blog platform. And we use that a lot for, for school visits and, and groups. But you, any visitor can use this as well. And photo booth, this had about 2,000 people participated in it. And it was a, literally a simple photo booth. It's called Save Fromage. And you can take your photograph and share it quickly online. Or you can have a print as well. Um, I'll just swiftly go on. So this is the mobile phone app as well. So you can see in kind of the bottom right hand, left hand corner where you can kind of fill in the images and, and learn more about that. Um, this is people's zoetrope. So we wanted to look at how, how photography can break down it also in the filmmaking process. So the idea is that you stand in front of the screen, you try and take the perfect pose of the, of the break dancer on the right, and it kind of projection maps your body, and you get all the points right, and then it would make a stop frame animation of every photograph that it takes of you, and it looks like you're break dancing, and you join in with all the other people that have taken part before you. But you also can share that as an animated GIF and um, also be part of the overall projects for other visitors to come and see you too. This is one of our, our biggest mass participation projects, which is called Mob Format. Uh, we've been running this since 2004, which since before mobile, pho mobile phones were, were that interactive. Initially, it started by people emailing us the, the images. The idea is that we print out every photograph that gets sent to us on a, a variety of themes. So this was the 2011 theme around um, exposures from the public realm. But as we went along, we, we last year collaborated with IM, which is a mobile phone um, photo app. And we literally printed out every single image that got sent through to us. Um, we had a large format printer donated by a printing company. We had workers on the machine cutting up every single photograph. But it's also a, proce um, a project for uh, kind of examining collaborative curata cur curation. <laughs> And uh, we did a, a stop motion animation of the four weeks of the exhibition. It was very fascinating to see kind of how people use the space, how people talk to each other, what areas they'll, they'll put the photographs up on. So each photograph was printed on a kind of sticky back material. So you could actually take the photograph and position it in the space. And we also had collaborations in, in Delhi, Jakarta, and um, in Mumbai. And we had artists embedded in some of the biggest waste sites in the world. And we had live streams from there. Um, all around the theme of mass participation, mass production, and the waste that is the after effect of kind of our overconsumption and overproduction. 
So from these waste sites, we had photographers working with the people who were working there, and they were producing images and sending them through to us that we were printing out that was combining with the general public as well. So there about 7,000 people from about 198 countries took part in this project and fed through their images, and people would come to the festival to see their work and to contribute more, and there was projections around it as well, and whole. it was kind of a really lively, a lively hub for the festival. Um, I'm just going to swiftly go on to the towards the end, yeah. Um, this is one project that uses GPS and we invited people, everyone who visited the festival, which is about 100,000 people, they would come and take a photograph wherever they were in the festival or bring a photograph that they had that related to the theme and everything would be kind of GPS tagged. Uh, we print it out with this small pogo printer that's on the bottom left there um, and it would be tagged and people would write something on the, on the um, luggage tag as well and put it on the map. And, okay, just a swift go through. So, just to finish off, this is the human printer. Um, they collaborate with whole teams of people. So they're uh, an artist collective, they're available online. You can send them their print, um, send them your print for them to print out. And um, what we did was set up a team of printers. So they print literally by hand and you can, come and watch them doing that. So another thing that we're quite interested in is exposing the process. So not only showing that after, after you know, the produce, after the event of the creative process, but where you can come and in, engage with people in, the, in the, uh, the act of making. So here people are every day doing a different color. So we break down the image into the CYMK and one day they'll, they'll do the different dots of the different colors and build up an image literally by hand. Um, if you want to take part in that, you choose your different printers. Everyone works in a different way. Everyone's got a different character. And um, you can request an original artwork from them. It was an amazing spectacle. It was brilliant and, yeah, fantastic. So I also work for 1,000 Words, so check out that magazine. This is where Derby is. Come, welcome anytime, especially next year. 12th of March is going to be our launch night of Format Festival. Here's our websites. You can always find us very easily, just Google format. And we've got more time for discussion. So I just wanted to, hope that's been interesting. It's been a really quick, fast overview of a variety of projects, but we can draw on them for the discussion in a bit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Louise. Um, next will be Abby Chan, and she'll be introducing a few of her projects regarding activism and community. Um, so I think, what Luis just, uh, the presentation Luis just gave is a really kind of macro approach in terms of curating. And I want to go into some sort of a detail about micro curating using uh, about two examples about what we do. So my topic is curating culture. And um, when, I, when I think about curating, I try my best to think about uh, three questions. Um, who is your audience? And um, who is willing to listen to you? And then who is um, sharing that secret with you? So that's kind of sometimes what I think about curating. So this is where I work, uh, Chinese Culture Center and Chinese Culture Foundation of San Francisco. I came to uh, work at this place in 2006. At the time, um, the organization's mission was to preserve, promote, and influence the Chinese and Chinese-American culture in the United States. But um, today, the mission, um, I think it just recently changed about two years ago, is uh, to spark intercultural discovery through art, education, and engagement. In the late 2006, when I joined the Culture Center, um, it was very clear to me that I need to innovate the program, the space, um, and shape the foundation's unique curatorial positioning, which highlights our making process and provide the channel to emerging and mid-career artists of Chinese descent. And this vision resulted in an open yet focused platform that encouraged imagination and risk-taking. So um, I curated about 50 uh, exhibitions in the organization, but I'm going to talk about 
two major ones that is relevant to today as participatory and also social activism. Woman uh, is a project on feminism, gender, queer equality, and sexual freedom. It was incepted in China with a series of workshops, symposium with both the Sun Yixin University in Guangzhou, Fudan University in Shanghai, and New York University in both New York and Shanghai and also NGOs of queer in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. The project later built, was built into an exhibition that toured across the Pacific. It started in Shanghai, then, go, uh, then went into San Francisco, and recently in Miami. The project includes scholars, academics, uh, artists, activists, sex workers, and NGO leaders. The exhibition includes works of important performance artists in China, uh, He Cheng Yao, and in America, Anna Therese Fernandez, and emerging artists like um, actually one of um, the uh, winner of this uh, finalist of this year's uh, Wing Award, Gao Ling. And they're ba base, they're both uh, male, female, uh, street and queer artists participating. So I want to take one example of this participatory activism and also the morphed exhibitions in three cities. A lot of times when I do a project, it's never static. It's not just a pure import. It has to transform in some form. So when I first approached Gao Ling, it was because the work that she did uh, that is kind of like a collaborative uh, work that mocking the sexual harassment in the subway in China. Uh, as many of you know, this is a serious problem across Asia in the public transportation. So she used um, domestic object, object in the kitchen, such as tea urns, uh, cake makers uh, to make metal bra, to wear that in the subway. But it started as a utopian process that you wear that and you, you encourage touching. Um, but then actually no one will harass you or touch you because the obvious bra that you're wearing. But then when I included her in the woman show in Shanghai, she at the time was only doing this performance with her friends at the late night in the subway when there's no one watching. But the NGO uh, group in China saw the work who was already, uh, who was also participating in the woman show um, it's called the Shanghai Girls Love. It's a lesbian and feminist group in Shanghai. And the f six months after the exhibition, there was the official statement made by the Shanghai subway station uh, posting an image of a girl wearing a semi-transparent uh, dress and saying that, girl, if you wear like this, you're going to ask for harassment, so you need to behave yourself. So in terms of um, a protesting in China, it's illegal. So what the NGO group did was ask Gao Ling to land the metal bra, and then the NGO group used the iPad saying, it's a dress, not a yes, uh, which later on become a national news. And they did this type of performance but actually the nature of that is protest in the Shanghai subway that very quickly uh, went viral on the internet and become national news. So this is one of the part that you see how artwork is being transformed into a social activism tool, but it doesn't lose its own artistic value, but even adding more. So when, uh, when the show opened in Shanghai, the performance of the protest did not happen. But then when it got to San Francisco, in the San Francisco exhibition site, we were able to feature the video and the image of the protest. And by the time we go to Miami, it already, we also can include the news and the broadcast from the CCTV and everything into the exhibition as well. Also, as another part of this morphed, uh, exhibition as it continued to grow to make, make it relevant in each city. When the show traveled to San Francisco, the China sex worker part is not necessarily a, a known um, a sort of a relevancy in San Francisco. So we invited the Mexico-born but San Francisco-based artist Anna Therese Fernandez 
she used ice to cast um, uh, an ice high heel shoe. And by standing, doing a performance in Oakland, where it's known for have a lot of teenage prostitutes, um, she made the uh, work actually corresponding to the China sex worker poster, which is also using the symbolizer of a high heel shoe. So as it continued to morph, uh, going to different cities, we add different artists into the show to reflect the locality um, of the exhibition space. And now I want to talk about uh, in de detail about a recent project I have do I've been doing. It's called the Keywords Project. Keywords Project has three components. There's the Keyword Lab, where the artist Shutan will be using uh, the gallery space as an interview chamber to talk to people about certain issues that uh, they're mutually interested. Uh, recently, it has been botany and previously is about land and food consumption. And Keyword Lab is a one-on-one -on -one experience the uh, general public or a target audience will have the opportunity to talk with the artist uh, on the kind of um, experience they have. Um, but throughout the conversation, they're going to define the keywords and give meaning to these words that is not being defined by the dictionary. And then the keyword school is where the artist Shutan will conduct workshop with um, different kind of participants. He has done this twice in Venice Banali. Also, he has done this in Location One, New York, uh, the YB, uh, YBC, which is Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, and also in Berlin and uh, Holland. So I have great respect for Shutan as an artist. Uh, he is a founding member of the Big Tail Elephant uh, in Guangzhou in the 1980s. Um, which is an uh, extremely uh, active time for avant-garde uh, contemporary art to emerge in China. And Big Tail Elephant is one of the most important pioneering group at the time. So as a founding member uh, of this uh, avant-garde group, he continued to, um, uh, uh, to create art, uh, even in today's highly commercialized um, uh, China's art world. Um, and he has taken on sort of like an anti-aesthetic and anti-pictorial approach that his medium now is basically, basically conversation. So conversation is his medium as his art. So Keyword School is for him to work with um, participants like a school format, and then they give some sort of um, non-static, uh, sort of uh, non-structured curriculum. And it's a school without predetermined goal. Um, it's sort of like a new public art space. Um, the artists, the participants, and all the classmates are all part of this process. And through the discussion and dialogues, you're creating art. While I have great respect for Xu Tan and his work, I always find his work problematic. The way it got presented in Venice Banali and uh, in Location One or in YBCA, they're highly filtered. The audience um, are kind of like the usual suspect going into this very sophisticated um, institutions. So, um, so I wonder if we can deploy the keywords into the community, like every day to the ordinary people. So I've been talking this idea with him, and he has been very open about it, and he really wants to try it. But he also raised some very important questions, is what do we mean community and ordinary people? Are ordinary people the community and vice versa, which are great questions. So. Um, so finally, um, we got funding from the city of San Francisco to do this project. And there was a lot of questions I had you know, asked in advance uh, to the project, but we sort of went ahead um, despite all the skepticism about working with, first of all, a non-local artist, an international artist, and also, also artists of such a high caliber into the community. Can that really be deployed? Can the artist approach be really approachable. So, um, so, but 
knowing that the nature of this um, of this particular project, I intentionally don't want to do the project in our gallery space, which is very sort of high art looking, uh, high ceilings and all white boxes. So uh, what we did is we went to the uh, alleyway in Chinatown and um, asked for kind of like a, a kind of like a situation of a half lease, half donation from the uh, landowner, uh, the property owner. Um, it's in the alleyway that neighboring mahjong parlors, uh, Chinese herbal shop, family associations, and the fortune cookie factory. So it's a very diverse audience uh, and also passes by. Um, the lease uh, is expiring in uh, September, so it's a temporary space, but we're trying to raise funds because of how wonderful the project is going to uh, get this uh, space continue to work as a new alternative space. And the goal of this project is to partner with a non-art organization that has strong root in immigrant community and we chose Chinatown Community Development Center and hope to have a deeper engagement between artists, the youth of the low-income immigrants, uh, mon monolingual families. So under the artist's vision, uh, which is really broad um, and detailed, what I found very important is the program design and the partner awareness because um, for Xu Tan, he could be really whimsical. And uh, he, at first, proposed this very open structure, free flow, and uh, basically no guidance to the students and just wanting them to create anything they want. And that doesn't necessarily work with youth uh, who actually have a lot of uh, homework and different kind of uh, uh, social activities. So it's actually very important for us to come up with a program design that sort of having some um, task and framework for the students to get into. But the partner's buy-in is crucially important. And um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But the partner came into this hoping that we're going to finish a mural for them, having the artists leading the students. And of course, when we got in, the first thing Shutan was telling both the organizers and the students were, like, uh, we're not going to make artwork that normally think about as art. We are going to focus on the art process uh, that is actually very important for a lifetime. So uh, it's a very abstract and vague idea. It was very difficult for the community organization to embrace. But what is more important, I found, is also the participants' transformation. When they see progress with the work, which I'm also going to talk a bit more later, is going to shift the entire uh, direction of the program, uh, of this project. And it's going to have a life of, of its own. And at this time, we can have a real sense of engagement. OK. So, um, so this is one of the view that we're having uh, uh, with the participants, Lisa. And the community organizers, as I said, was first excited, then confused with this whole process when we're not making art, and then really resented uh, in a lot of ways in terms of organizing the youth to participate in the workshop and also every step of creating this process. And for the students, uh, for the youth, they were first obliged to do this because we actually paid them to participate in this workshop. And also confused by this abstract idea of using a dialogue as a form of medium in creating the things that they're interested in and um, later on conduct interview about it and finally figure out the keywords. But as they progress with their very first um, discovery on their own observations, um, they actually started to get excited and excited and started to have ideas of their own and now fully embracing it. So we're seeing one of the one-on-ones with, uh, with, the, with the artist and actually the organizer was very against the idea of having the use to be with the artist on a one-on-one -on -one base. So I have to sit in as sort of a mediator. Um, so this is 
uh, totally we have nine participants. They are all on their way producing their own dialogue with their own family and friends. Initially, as we see the program was doing so well, um, immediately the organization wanted to do a survey with the kids and saying how wonderful they feel about this project. But uh, Xu Tang immediately came in and cut off this idea and say that, you know, instead of doing the survey with the students to collect some sort of uh, a compliment for ourselves, let the students to go out to do the survey with their families and friends. And then we use that survey to really helping them analyzing what they've been finding. So um, I want to end um, this presentation with, uh, uh, I normally don't end with quote, but, um, but this one I found very useful, is um, the problem of cultural reproduction in a globalized world are only partly described in terms of problems of race, class, gender, and power. Although these are surely crucially involved, an even more fundamental fact is that the production of locality always, as I have argued, a fragile and difficult achievement is more than ever shot through with contradiction destabilized by human motion. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Luis and Abby, for your amazing um, presentation of all these projects. And um, their thinking and practice, I think, were so dense that it's impossible to share that in 20 minutes. And, um, but I thought it was really fascinating for us to observe all these projects, for us to have a better conversation in context of what the community is and what art making means in the midst of it. Um, one thing that I maybe wanted to start the conversation with was the context of place. Um, and that deals with many different kinds of things. For Louise, I think she has kind of the main center. And then there are commissions and projects that artists actually um, propose um, regarding the context of the neighborhood, whether, whether it is Derby or a very historical site such as factory. And I think also for um, Abby, uh, for example, especially for the keywords that he had to come into as a non-local artist to come into a very specific community and how do you reconcile sort of that institutionalized place uh, with a localized community. So um, I think there are a lot of sort of tension and things that you have to sort of navigate in th between those two places. So if you guys could elaborate that a little bit more. Okay, here it is. Um, yeah, I mean, um, as you could see that I was going through quite a lot of variety of projects and the notion of place and identity um, becomes more or less relevant depending on the type of project that we're doing. Some of them are very global, some of them are proposed to us by artists, some of them are invited by, by me, I might have an idea and I'll, I'll approach an artist, we might talk about it for a long time. Um, it really depends, I think, some of the things that we're talking about, about kind of this openness of platform and how people kind of translate their identity or their thoughts or what it is that they're contributing, whether it's about identity or place or not, or whether it's about other kind of more global issues. I think it's, it's so, there's so many variations on that. It's kind of uh, tricky to kind of say something specific about it, but um, the project that actually brings together people in a city that wouldn't otherwise meet creates a legacy and a, a collective memory of something that is, is quite extraordinary. And that, that sustains in, in people's lives and has, has a direct effect and it kind of enables them to encounter and have an access point to art that is very different from kind of visiting a space with a ready-made show. So they've actually participated, contributed and um, enabled themselves to become visible in that place and it builds a new identity for that place, it builds an alternative kind of reality in some ways. Um, yeah, I mean that's, that's a couple of things to say on that. I don't know about Abby. Well, I think when I think about locality, um, it is a really important issue that I feel like um, the art or the process t definitely have to be grounded. Um, but um, in terms of having Xu Tang, who is an, sort of an outsider, not just outside of uh, US, but also outside of the community, outside of Chinatown, to come into this uh, community, um, I, I think he's not just uh, one any other artist is because 
I seen how he did projects in other places. I have this great faith in him um, that he can he can execute. But on the other hand, uh, his understanding with a different type of uh, you know people and community uh, allowed me to have the faith in him uh, to work with the community youth. But um, because of this identity that he has done high art and also. Um, coming from, you know, sort of like China, mainland, even though he is a, a permanent residence in the US, uh, there is a lot of skepticism and also suspicion uh, with this artist coming to this community and what he's gonna do, especially when he's not teaching the practical skills that, uh, that the community actually wants. So I think um, the, the issue also, uh, goes back to the importance of the institution at this point and mm -hmm. also the role of a curator, uh, what you're gonna do to facilitate the two. So um, if the artists just go directly into the community and just have that engagement themselves, I really don't think this is gonna happen. So the facilitation uh, also become the key. Great, and that kind of leads to perhaps then my next question, the idea of how. Um, out of some of our conversations prior to this panel discussion, I think the idea of how do you then execute the sort of curatorial vision with an artist within the midst of the community and how how itself becomes its own course. And the idea of penetration of community, art education, and transformation, these are all the things that we want to talk about with the community. So um, if you guys can elaborate that also as a curator is how much control you have that um, in process of problem solving in many different situations that you both have. Mm. That's quite a broad question. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's really, yeah, it depends. I mean, every artist is different, and whether we're working with one artist or whether we're working with a group of people who are collaborating, whether it's an, um, you're creating a, a platform where people can feed in their ideas openly and freely, or whether it's something that's more structured that, um, that has to feed through to an endpoint that you can market that will have visitors coming through through the door too. So it depends what your endpoint ambition is. Um, in terms of, I suppose, controlling the process, it's, it's a really live discussion with the artists and the community and the participants. So you have to be really flexible and strong and kind of command the, pr the project, but in an in a open-minded way and be really creative in your thinking process. A lot, of, a lot of it's to do with the psychologies of the characters that are involved, which is really difficult to generalize until you have them there with you. It depends how much people are contributing, how much time they're putting into the project. So the, the film project that we did asked people to commit either one day, a few hours. So you have to kind of audit the amount of time that you're asking people to put in. And if somebody's coming on a, a repeated um, basis, they're transforming, they're developing their skills, they're getting more ideas, they're getting more invested in the project. And then it starts to get more complex as well and they, they start to align with the artists in terms of authorship and, and then we'll come on onto this later. So kind of managing that process. So you really need really, really strong project management team. You need the artists to work out their position. You need a lot of discussion before you even start. You need clarity of process in terms of what people are going to get out of it, all the participants as well, and kind of think about the value that people and how you register that value and how it's visible at the end as well. So everyone has their own kind of vanities and egos which get involved as well. That's very troublesome sometimes and you have to manage that as well. And mostly when people are contributing something, they want to see that contribution somehow, apparently. Um, whether they're participating in a portrait, whether their portrait gets included in the final exhibition. If it's, if it's not guaranteed, you have to tell them to be at the beginning. And if they don't like how they look in that portrait, you have to kind of apply the artistic license and coach them through that process. And especially if they haven't, I mean, some of the trouble that we had with the, um, the crowdsource project, where there's an exchange of money, the economics of the project get in, entwined with it as well. And when somebody's paying to take part, then they feel like they have more right to say more. Um, as well as if people are giving their free time, then you have to value that free time and not take that for granted. You know, they're coming forward, they're coming out of their other lives that they have, which are also very valuable uh, to come and give something, you know, towards the project. So you have to play with all these power politics and vanities and egos and expectations, and especially if people have never taken part in an art project before. 
Um, it's how, how do you break down what is art and why it is that they, they can participate. And, you know, people say, oh, I can't draw, I can't act, I can't, I can't, I can't, all these things. And how do you enable people to think that actually they can or they're doing it all the time? I mean, to kind of say, I'm not a photographer, but you're using your camera. How do you become more visual, visual literate? How do you develop your skills to, to do something that's more kind of satisfying in the way that you want to do it and how you match that ambition? There are lots of different perspectives on that. Well, <laughs> well, for me, I think um, um, we're taping. <laughs> I really don't want. Um, I really try not. Well, I ha um, I have this no asshole rule, so I try not to work with people who are too difficult to work with, and especially in the engagement projects, because it's not just one person. I can deal with this kind of difficult personality if it's a solo, which I still try to avoid, but when it's a, a, a social engagement and also when it comes down to like community partnership, I can't deal with a very big ego and you know, uh, really difficult personality. It's just not gonna work and it's gonna hurt a lot of things and burn a lot of bridges. So that for sure. Uh, and then Shu Tan in this case, I mean, he's very humble, but at the same time, he also has principle. You know, on his principle, he actually doesn't really uh, give in or compromise, which I highly appreciate. Uh, do, they do have to be strong at some point. And um, when I do these kind of project, the other thing when you talk about control the process or, or something, I, it's never fully controlled or know the outcome. It's always um, more and more, I think. Before, I think, uh, in my early days, I, I tried to really use the outcome to drive the process, but now it's the other way around. Um, I, I focus a lot more on the process and let the journey to define the destination. But, um, and more and more I feel like I like to work with the artists whose work that I only understand half or 70% maybe, or even less. Um, I like to have that sort of challenge and unknown to me. Um, particularly in a collaborative process because you want to leave a lot of space and imagination so that in this process when everyone works together, you, all, all of you, not just me, the artists, all the community participants, that we're going to get on this journey and discover something together that could be surprising to all of us. And I think this is what is happening with keywords and also with women. So I like that aspect a lot, and more and more I enjoy that. That automatically answered some of other questions, so maybe I'll have about two more, and then I'll just open up the question and answer form um, to the audience. Maybe the third one, well, third question that I would like to ask, especially out of my observation of your projects, that there was a very specific agent of diffuser to make the idea of art accessible to public. I don't know if that makes sense, whether it was food or the idea of music or the idea of education. And artists were able to sort of utilize that idea and to be able to have the connection to the accessibility. So um, I think what I wanted to ask was sort of the idea of that agents of the future and also um, the accessibility. Um, and how do you make, how do you bridge the gap in between? And I think that's kind of a big question again. Um, but it's did I make any sense with the question? <laughs> I yeah. think I'm just rambling with my own ideas about this entire thing. But um, I think we're trying to make that accessible. Um, I, I think everyone is trying, all the institutions are trying. Um, and I more and more, the reason why we do it in an alleyway and instead of doing it inside of our gallery space is because of the very reason to make it more accessible, to make it more approachable. Um, and, but also to what extent, and I, you know, I was, talking to some of you here about some ideas in the public space. And it just, more and more I'm intrigued by the idea of museum without walls and, you know, uh, space beyond the place, you know, so. Yeah, just to add to that really, kind of similar, similar things that we're working with, but kind of also trying to work out the challenge of making the gallery space that place as well. And we've got the fortunate thing of, of having, obviously we can do quite a lot on the internet <laughs> and that's very accessible. We use familiar media, we work with Facebook and Twitter and 
Um, obviously, that doesn't always reach everywhere around the world, but um, the gallery space, we're trying to work out how we can turn it inside out so that people can feel comfortable and, and free and open to come in and experiment with that. I mean, that's why some, some of the endpoint happens there, so that people come in and are inducted into the, the ways of a gallery space and feel comfortable to come back again. Um, but we do go out on the streets, and the streets are really the, cr the key point to this, and, and you do have to get out. And if you do genuinely want to come and have people involved in your projects that wouldn't otherwise engage, you do need to go to them and, and, and infiltrate the, <laughs> the city and the places around, yeah. And the last question is because the process itself is so fluid and there's so many exchanges of ideas and therefore the final execution or the product of the project, does it, whom does it belong to, the idea of authorship, authorship? Is it the artist or is it the curator? Is it the people of the community, right? And the democracy of that, um, uh, the idea, right? The, um, the who owns and directs the idea. So if we could um, kind of talk about that a little bit and I'll open up to the audience. Yeah, yeah it gets very fraught. Is uh, inter intellectual property rights is a very um, uh, ferocious area and everyone wants to you know, be identified as the originator of that particular idea and especially when you have things like more than, you know, for the, the film project again when we had around 20,000 people contributing to credit everybody in particular in terms of the thing that they contributed is, is really complex. And to do that effectively is hard. And now the artwork is being taken by Marinella. She's the headline artist, it's her work. And all these people have participated to create it, 20,000 people in Berlin, Madrid, and Derby. Um, and it's impossible to mention that many people in an in a easy to consume way. Um, but in terms of kind of referencing the photographer, listing the participants, it's like any, I suppose, major feature film in includes a lot of people as well. So they're in the credits, but because this was slightly different, it's an artwork and there's more time. But you can see in her artwork that what she does to kind of share this process is she, it's not just a kind of actors portraying something. She actually videos the um, um, interview process. She in, uh, she films the whole things around the sides and internally, so she reflects back the process in the artwork itself. So it's, it's apparent, the process. So she's part of that as well, but also the people's voice is very clear in there. It's an excellent, excellent question in terms of um, engagement artwork. Um, actually, one of the pushback we got initially from the community, and which is really legit, is um, the fear of the artists come to the com community and consume the community and then just take whatever the artists think that he needs or she needs and then they just, you know, go to go on to produce their own work. So the um, permission from the students to participate um, by getting the parental form was actually a bit of a stretch. And also for the artist to create the work, um, uh, we were thinking about like who does that belong to, and definitely it belongs to the youth participants. And then, but then um, for the institution, because we're going to, you know, make the cultural produ production in terms of cataloging and archiving, so that part um, as kind of like info hub that is being kept at the uh, Chinese Culture Foundation. And then Xu Tan, as he was also using the keyword school, school space as keyword lab, so his interviews and his research, that part is belong to himself. So, but it's still a pretty complicated situation as he was interviewing politicians, government uh, workers, sweatshop owners, and these people, you know, some of them specifically asked for not to keep their name, and someone was very specific about making a statement. So many of these are very complicated, as you know, Louis saying, and um, and I think that part is going to take some bit of a negotiation between the artists and their interviewees. Just in, I mean, just in general, but also, what, Abby, what you're saying, just the idea when a community, when a community organizer wants to, they come to you and they want to engage in a project, what is it they actually, you know, if they're a nonprofit, they're not an arts organization, what is it they actually 
tend to want because you were saying like they thought they were going to make a mural so it was very tidy what they wanted out of it I mean is that you know why are they even willing to talk to you or even approach you because a lot of people approach you with some of these projects well, um, they definitely recognize the importance of art and the impact that art could make. Um, but then they also tend to think that art making and the process itself doesn't cost any money, um, does, doesn't need any budget. Um, but it, so they feel like, oh, you know, it's, it seems to be very easy. Artists can just make that kind of magic. And some people even say that, oh, Abby, you can just pull off any shows at any time. But they because not familiar with that process, it's, it's important to get them involved in the process and understand how much work that is. But then at the same time, um, community for sure, I think at first they were hoping to get something very tangible and very concrete. But now as they, you know, more involved in the process, I started to see an attitude change. They, they're more willing to embrace and help and see this as a true collaboration and see the benefits. But it was definitely, doesn't, it, it can't take it for granted. Yeah, I think it's a similar thing. I think a lot of encounters we have problems with are with city councillors who expect, um, uh, I mean, city councillors and our arts council funders, they gauge um, numbers of participants. I mean, mass particip we don't do it because of that, but we, we care about um, and, and are interested in the, the structure of mass participation, how you get that many people engaged. But it's, uh, it is kind of, we, we value the, um, the participant uh, experience a bit more highly than the volume of people. So that's something that we're always tackling in terms of negotiating with the councillors and what people are doing exactly. Um, the outcomes, I think we haven't really worked with organisations that expected something different from what happened, um, but it's more about the participant investment and what they think they'll get out of it and what how they think they will feature in the end as well that's always a problematic area for us yeah any other questions okay. oh lisa <laughs> There, there is actually a scheduled performance, so we'll end here. But thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Abby and Louise. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, there's a performance at uh, the podium level inside the um, exhibition gallery. So everyone, um, if you could, if you're interested, please go and watch the performance. Um, and then after that. Um, there's a symposium on air pollution, um, and we hope you would come and um, also attend the symposium as the actual photography uh, award is about air pollution, and uh, we do value the discussion on the theme. So look forward to seeing you all. <laughs>